Hey guys, this is John. This is a preview for a new course that we have for sale on Chessable. It is Game Changer, Alpha Zero's groundbreaking chess strategies and the promise of AI. This is based on a book that was just released by Grandmaster Matthew Sadler and Women's International Master Natasha Regan. The publisher is New in Chess. This book is hot off the presses. Uh, New in Chess was kind enough to send me the print version of this. I will be previewing the Chessable version, of course, but as always, Everything that's in this print version is in the Chessable version. We've just created quizzes, so you can test yourself in Chessable fashion along the way if you like. Uh, but this is a pretty beefy book. There are over 400 pages here. And I think that's very impressive because Alpha Zero has not been in the news for very long. I remember being over in London playing the London Chess Classic Fide Open in December 2017. So not that long ago, a little over a year ago. And that's when the initial news of Alpha Zero broke and it's its match against Stockfish. And it was definitely the talk of the tournament. It was really exciting being in a big open event where everyone had just heard this news about a self-learning AI, something that taught itself chess and had no prior programming about what chess is, other than the rules, of course, um, and the implications for, for chess as we know it and uh, really some inspiration that we can all draw from Alpha Zero. And the games were amazing to look at, but... In 2018, Alpha Zero and Stockfish played another series of games, hundreds of more games actually, under a bit more regulated circumstances, so TCEC conditions, and the results were similar, Alpha Zero dominated, but those games make up the majority of what you have in Game Changer. And I want to say I love Game Changer. This is a phenomenal book. If you're interested in, of course, Alpha Zero and the implications of AI as it pertains to chess, you'll love this. If you're interested on a technical level as to how um, you know traditional engines differ from this self-learning AI, there's a lot of discussion about that. If you want to hear from the DeepMind team, so how they, they came up with the concept of AlphaZero and how it trained itself, there's discussions there. There are a lot of historical examples. So Sadler and Regan do an awesome job of tying in human players, so us, us carbon-based players and talking about themes that they've seen in human games from great players of the past and present that relate to what Alpha Zero does. There's really a lot to absorb here. I will say that the chess content of this book is pretty high. So, you know, if you're 1800 plus, you're gonna be able to absorb a lot of the chess content. If you're lower rated, you still can, but it's gonna be harder going and you might find some sections to be pretty difficult. But yeah, if you're interested in, in computer chess and everything else that has to do with it, AI, this book is, is right for you, and I, I really enjoyed this. There's a lot to absorb here. So let's take a look at the course. So it has 110,000 plus words of instruction, 148 trainable variations, 119 informational lines. Let's click into it here. Starts out with a foreword by Gary Kasparov. He knows a thing about uh, or two about AI and computer chess, right? <laughs> uh, actually, Kasparov... His match with Deep Blue in the late 90s was the, the first thing I, I really followed in chess. I believe it was 96 or 97. It was I remember looking at the games every day in the newspaper and breaking out my little chess set and following along. It was pretty cool. Uh, there's an introduction by Demis Asabis, the CEO of DeepMind, also a former child chess prodigy himself. And now the book is broken into parts with chapters within these parts. So part one is on Alpha Zero's history, and it begins by talking a bit about uh, traditional chess engines and how they've been programmed and their history against each other. This game, Kesa versus Chaos, is from, I believe, the 1970s. There's also some, some engines you might recognize. Of course, we all know Stockfish, considered to be the strongest engine. But also Houdini is right up there too, and Houdini was kind of the, the big bad kid on the block before Stockfish came along. If you're even more old school than that, you'll remember Ribka, and even before that, Fritz. There's a long list of engines that have had their day, and there always seems to be an engine that takes the place of them, and now we have Alpha Zero. So there are some examples from previous engine versus engine games. Chapter 2000 gets into um, Alpha Zero itself. And it's kind of a preview for what you can expect to see in this book. So it includes some of the initial games, Stockfish and Alpha Zero. 
And it also discusses positions. So the meaning of that zero, 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 maybe if I can go down to even, let's say this Vladimir Kramnik versus Lovon Aronian example here, uh, Sadler and Regan discuss it. So he talks about how a lot of engines, when you're analyzing with them, sometimes they'll get to a very complicated position and they'll just give this triple zeros evaluation. The engines will just say, this position's equal. They might even throw a repetition or two in there and show how the game should end in a draw. And they were talking about how that differs from Alpha Zero and how Alpha Zero was able to find so many resources in positions that traditional engines have just thought were basically equal or dead drawn. Um, and he gives many examples along the way. Uh, this game here is a game between two, two amazing players, of course, Vladimir Kramnik and Levon Aronian, one of which retired, Vladimir just retired. But that was kind of a cool introduction to how Alpha Zero is almost a paradigm shift in that way, that these positions, which all the engines agree are basically dead level, and he even shows some graphs to show how various engines analyze them, seemingly dead level, in fact, contain these, these deep resources that this, this AI has uncovered. Now, let's go to the next part. Oh, I should mention that chapter three is a nice interview with Demis Hassabis, again, CEO of DeepMind, pretty extensive here, talking about his initial career in chess. There you can see him as a kid with a chess trophy, I assume. So long interview there. Definitely worth reading if you, if you want to know the backstory of Alpha Zero. So now part two, inside the box. This is where we get into the nitty gritty of how Alpha Zero thinks and, and understands chess. So how Alpha Zero thinks, chapter four. And it says right off the bat, Alpha Zero's self-learning design is different to handcrafted chess engines such as Stockfish. In this tour, in this chapter, we take a quick tour of the mechanics of Alpha Zero's thinking as it trains and as it plays. So there's um, interviews with, with the DeepMind team, kind of better explaining how this works. Um, yeah, how Alpha Zero works, the theory, learning rather than being programmed. So in a nutshell, Alpha Zero, aside from having the moves programmed in, it taught itself everything about chess. Uh, there were a couple other parameters, I believe, when they first had Alpha Zero start playing itself, they limited the games. They called it a draw after a certain number of games because the very early games it was playing against itself were, as you might imagine, pretty nonsensical, just maneuvering pieces around. Like it didn't know what the objectives were, what pieces you should capture, uh, the values of pieces. So aside from a little bit of input just to, you know, uh, tell it not to move pieces around endlessly, it is just a self-learning AI, no opening database, no table bases, no pre-programmed values. Traditional engines have values for all sorts of different things. So it values the bishop pair to an extent. It values uh, king safety, pawn structure, all of that stuff. And it's condensed down into an algorithm that spits out the best move. All of the usual engines uh, process that way. And hence they give evaluations in terms of a base unit pawn. So, you know, an engine will point out in this position, White is plus 0.5, half a pawn better, or black is minus 1.2, black's 1.2 pawns better. So traditional engines have that algorithm, but not alpha zero, totally self-learning using a Monte Carlo approach. And this section gets into the nitty gritty of that. It's very interesting to read. Uh, alpha zero versus Stockfish eight. This is actually just a illustration of how alpha zero thinks on a given move and includes a discussion of Alpha Zero's nodes and the tree approach it uses. And I was just talking about how the traditional engines use the base unit pawn and they give evaluations of a position in terms of that. And that can be kind of frustrating sometimes because if you study chess, you know about these positions where an engine uh, at some point will give a very large advantage for one side. It might say like plus two and a half, but actually it doesn't know how to win the position and it just maneuvers around. And in some cases it might be just a theoretical draw, but the engine doesn't realize it yet. Alpha zero, it's totally different. That's one thing I was very interested to find out. So alpha zero thinks in terms of win probabilities. It doesn't try to assign um, a pawn value or a numeric value to an advantage in a position. It just thinks purely in terms of win probabilities based on um, how many times it's played itself and what it's seen before. And it has various nodes that it proceeds down to try to find the best move and assigning 
percent chances of victory along the way. Totally different approach. And it gives an example here from one of the games that was actually widely reviewed from late 2018 when the new batch of Stockfish and AlphaZero games came out. And there's some really cool charts to show how AlphaZero came up with its preferred move in this position. Uh, chapter 5, Alpha Zero style, meeting in the middle. So it touches on some aspects of what you can expect to see from Alpha Zero's games. We will get into that in more detail coming up here. Yep, there are more games. So throughout this book, there's just there's not really a section that goes by where you're not seeing Alpha Zero versus Stockfish games, uh, extrapolating on um, the, the many, many games that they played. Now, one thing I do want to say... I was I was really glad to see this. So DeepMind and Google kind of took a little flack when when Alpha Zero first came out. There were some people who were suggesting, um, you know, maybe it wasn't quite fair. I myself thought, hey, maybe maybe DeepMind should have invited the Stockfish team in and let them set up Stockfish to their preferred preferences and then play a match against Alpha Zero. But they kind of just played Stockfish as a proof of concept about the AI and. That was enough for them. But it was cool to see um, Sadler and Regan giving Stockfish its due. So actually at the end of this chapter, there's an example where um, Stockfish managed to beat Alpha Zero. And just to also showcase the kind of quizzes you can see along the way in this course, let's take a look at this one. Okay, so we're in Stockfish's shoes here, if Stockfish could have shoes. Um, white to move. White to move and induce Alpha Zero to blunder. If you want to pause your video and try to figure that out, feel free to do so. All right. So Stockfish started with King E2 here, and Alpha Zero snatched up this pawn. And Sather and Regan mentioned how the very few times that Alpha Zero lost to Stockfish, it was often due to overpressing. And here, could have been overpressing, or maybe more likely, just a lack of understanding that this queen is actually going to get trapped. So now Stockfish played Rook G1 b5 and king f1 further reinforcing the rook we can capture this pawn on b5 rook b2 and now is the end of the quiz white intends to play rook to e2 and then pawn to f3 and that queen on h2 will be trapped it's already entombed and we're, we plan to attack it like that and have the king defend both rooks so nice little example of how stockfish you know we should give stockfish its due it it can hold its own, and in fact, many, many of the games that were played between Stockfish and Alpha Zero were draws. Uh, that's one thing that we should point out. So, nice to see that. So yeah, part two, Inside the Box. Interesting discussion of the, the technical aspects of Alpha Zero, how it thinks about moves and how it differed from traditional engines. Uh, now let's go on to part three, Themes in Alpha Zero's Play. And you'll see that this is by far the longest chapter, 166 lines in this chapter. And this breaks down the major themes present throughout the Alpha Zero games. And we can kind of walk through chapter by chapter here. So yeah, chapter six starts out introduction to the themes. And now you've probably seen as I've been scrolling through various uh, games from historical players of the past, like I mentioned that Kramnik versus Aronian game. But Sadler and Regan, they really bring out the historical examples in this chapter, uh, starting with a game of Mikhail Shigorin's versus Wilhelm Steinitz, talking about some parallels from Shigorin's games to Alpha Zero. Because one thing about Alpha Zero, it, many people have commented on this, it has almost this human-like style in the way that it plays. Uh, it doesn't seem to play in the clinical, sometimes boring way that we associate with traditional engines. Like I myself, I haven't usually been interested in engine chess too much, but looking at Alpha Zero's games, there's a clear difference in how it plays, and it, it does seem more like a human when you play through these games. So there are a lot of historical parallels being drawn here in the discussion with the themes. But just to show some of these themes, uh, peace mobility, Alpha Zero very much strives for peace mobility and creating outposts. It loves to have options. Uh, peace mobility in terms of activity, attacking the king, the march of the rook's pawn. So Alpha Zero is a big, big fan of pushing the rook's pawns, uh, especially the H-pawn in many situations. Uh, obligatory Simon Williams reference. 
In fact, in that tournament where I first heard about Alpha Zero, Simon was playing there and he played a phenomenal game. I think on the either the day after or maybe two days after the announcement, uh, featuring an opening that Alpha Zero really liked. I think it was a Queen's Indian defense. So he's been definitely paying attention to Alpha Zero. So the March of the Rook's Pawn, attacking the King color complexes. There's a lot of examples in Alpha Zero's play where it attacks on a certain color complex, often very ruthlessly, often with opposite color bishops. Attacking the King, sacrifices for time, space, and damage. Opposite side castling, it was pretty ruthless against Stockfish. It definitely liked to, to mix it up and really press Stockfish. And opposite side castling is a way to try to induce your opponent to make mistakes and immediately signal you're going to put them under pressure. Uh, some other themes that I wrote down that Alpha Zero displayed and was very proficient at. Fixing the center, so often stabilizing the center situation and then playing on the wings. It often preferred unusual maneuvers, so... I'm going to show you guys a snippet of one game where it, um, it it plays a really bizarre series of moves. Again, peace mobility. There's a graph that Sadler and Regan show at one point comparing the number of, of legal moves that Alpha Zero has versus Stockfish as the move number increases. And it's pretty stark. Alpha Zero aims for positions where it has way more legal moves than, than Stockfish tend to have. So it likes to have options. Uh, knight maneuvers, especially knight maneuvers that induce weaknesses. Alpha Zero is a big fan of that. It prioritizes king safety. Um, yeah, number of themes, some of which are you know pretty standard, but some of which are pretty unexpected too. Let me show you that example with the very unusual series of moves here. This game, in my mind that I'm about to click through very quickly with you guys, this personifies Alpha Zero to me. And Sadler actually named some of these games. He calls this Bold Sir Lancelot. I think he did a review video for Chess24 on this too. I'm going to play through this real fast. But there's a, a sequence and a phase of this game where just the moves seemingly make no sense, but it ends up working out beautifully for White. <laughs> so this was a Queen's Indian defense. I'll go through the opening kind of fast. Same side castling. Okay, so starting right about here, h4. As Sadler says in the notes, one of Alpha Zero's favorite moves often played with the idea of advancing the h-pawn to h6, weakening black's kingside dark squares. And this also provides support for this knight g5 move, which you'll see coming up in a few more moves. So this is a trade of knights here. Queen b1. And very soon, knight g5. Threatening a checkmate on h7. And encouraging black stockfish to make this weakness f5. And what does alpha 0 do? It just goes right back. It says, you know what? I'm happy with that weakness I've just induced. Let's bring the knight back here. Bishop f6. Rook a2. Another rook pawn move coming up, a4. So let's push both of its rook pawns here. Okay, now this this is the sequence that when I first saw this game, I was like, what? <laughs> this looks like how an alien would play chess. King h2. All right. Innocent enough, right? But then the follow-up, rook h1. And not only that, very soon, knight g1. Seemingly returning the pieces to their original squares. I mean, who, who would come up with that? <laughs> and of course... Bishop f3, securing the pawn. This ends up working out really nicely for white. Bishop c1, another move seemingly setting up for the next game, returning the piece to the original square. More maneuvering. The knight works its way in. This knight has already been putting in good work. Remember, it started on f3 to g5 and then back again to f3. Comes into g6 here. And alpha 0 ended up winning... A very long and very fine game in this one. It's sacked an exchange coming up on d5. Some more maneuvering. I often had this impression that Stockfish was kind of just sitting back and trying to survive in the position. And to Stockfish's credit, it often did defend very tenaciously. But not, not enough in this case. Yeah, interesting comment by Sadler right here. He says, 
I wasn't I wasn't sure this position was so amazing for white, but Alpha Zero is at an 86.7% expected score, while my engines like white a lot too. Value between 0.7 and 1.0. So that's a reference to this base unit of pawns, how these engines describe things. So that right there shows you that difference in, in Alpha Zero, how it evaluates winning chances versus these engines, which just kind of put a number to it. Um, not in terms of winning percentage though. Yeah, this, this is a really nice game to play through, but basically White started advancing these E and D pawns, brought the knight back to E2 to secure C3. Stockfish tried to push the rook pawn, but Alpha Zero's center pawns were too much. So a lot of themes on display right there, the pushing of the rook pawn, the knight maneuvers to induce weaknesses, the king h2, rook h1 maneuver. It was often playing bizarre stuff like that seemingly putting pieces on their original squares or retreating pieces only to attack with them later or switch to the opposite side of the board. Another theme of Alpha Zero's games, it's really good at switching sides, kind of principle of two weaknesses style. So part three is all about those themes. And again, I really like the historical examples from great players past and present that are interspersed without, throughout this um, section and throughout the book in general. Yeah, you can see Magnus Carlsen, Ivan Shuk, Judith Polgar. Oftentimes it'll relate to one particular move that Alpha Zero played and show how it was similar to a famous move played in a famous game by a very strong human player. Uh, even some players that you don't hear about too often, like Blackburn, for instance, was an example here. And why don't we solve one? Yeah, Blackburn versus Jacques Schwartz. So if you want to solve this with me, you can. We were just talking about how Alpha Zero likes to induce weaknesses, so this is related to that. So white to play. Black has seemingly weakened their king side quite a bit, but if you want to try to pause this and figure out what white should do, you can do so now. Okay, so we want to get at Black's king for sure. If I were looking at this position for the first time, I would definitely consider bishop f6. I've already solved this, so I know what the move is. Let's go. Rook takes h5. We're trying to batter through here. And now we're going to go bishop f6. Trying to bring the queen in to one of these squares if possible. So bishop f4, black looking to interfere. But now we can ignore the attack on the queen and play rook takes h5, trying to set up rook h8 checkmate. Black plays knight g6. And now we're going to swing the queen over to h1. Incidentally, another move that Alpha Zero uh, will sometimes unexpectedly play, a queen to h1. And rook h8 is a huge threat. Black has to shed quite a bit of material here to try to survive. But I think even then they won't be successful. So I really like that, the historical analogies that were drawn here. Really bringing together engine chess, AI, and good old-fashioned human chess. So definitely the meatiest part of this book in terms of number of variations and examples to work through. Uh, now let's look at part four, the final part. This is going to be of special interest to you opening aficionados out there. Alpha Zero's opening choices. So here in chapter 14. One interesting thing right off the bat. So Alpha Zero as white, it was not a fan of E4. So the King's Pawn players out there, you might be uh, lamenting Alpha Zero's um, preference for other openings, but yeah, he was not a fan of E4. Played it initially when it was when it was starting out, but as it got better and better, it was gravitating to D4 and Knight F3 on move one. It really preferred those two moves, often combining them. Uh, within D4 openings, it was usually putting the Knight on F3 anyways, so it wasn't a big fan of approaches with like White playing F3 and the Knight coming to E2, like in the same-ish King's Indian, let's say. Um, some other opening stuff I wrote down. One of the reasons it doesn't like e4 as white is it thinks e4, e5 as black is very good. I think it was giving something like a 44 or almost 45% chance for black after e4, e5, which is pretty high quality. That's, that's around the number you like to see for defenses you're considering playing as black if it can score 45%. That's pretty good. Um, in this chapter, there's some discussions of how Alpha Zero treats certain openings. So because Alpha Zero and Stockfish played a bunch of games from uh, not only the standard position, but also predetermined opening positions, 
Regan and Sadler, because they were kind of granted exclusive access to Alpha Zero, they were able to test it from, from openings that they were interested in. So you'll see, for example, I believe it's chapter 15. Yeah, Matthew Sadler is a, one of the world's leading experts on the Samish variation of the King's Indian. If you're interested in studying that line for white, he's the guy to look at. You can just look up his games. He plays it phenomenally. He has a huge score. So he was able to test it in there. And it's just really neat to see how Alpha Zero handles the white and black sides of this opening. And Sadler talks about his amazement and how Alpha Zero uncovered a plan that he previously had never considered before. So there's two games here, Alpha Zero handle, handling it from both sides of the equation. I was also interested to see the section on the Carlsbad structure. So the Carlsbad structure, if you're unaware, you can see this diagram here. So it refers to this Queen's Gambit decline structure. You can also get it with colors reversed, like out of a London system, for instance, where the C pawn has been traded for the E pawn. And when that happens, one of the traditional plans known for a very long time is the so-called minority attack plan, which is illustrated here where white is pushing the B pawn all the way up to B5 to attack that black pawn on C6 in order to try to capture and induce a weakness or uh, potentially get black to capture or push the pawn to C5, produce some sort of weakness. Now, this is a time-honored plan. Sadler talks about how he met Mark Duretsky and, and discussed this plan with him. Uh, also, there's an English grandmaster, Keith Arkell, who plays these structures really well. But interestingly enough, Alpha Zero was not a fan of the minority attack. Like, really not a fan at all. It played it a couple times in its um, self-learning and against Stockfish, but overall, it did not prefer to go for that when in those structures. And that's pretty mind-blowing because it is, I would say, the dominant plan in Queen's Gambit decline structures where the C pawns traded for the E pawn. There are a couple other plans, especially the central oriented plan. If you've studied like my D4 repertoire on Chessable, you'll know which one that is playing F3 followed by E4. But there's a game that shows just how unique Alpha Zero's approach is to the whole Carlsbad structure. Um, it's this one right here. So yeah, themes of this game, using a Rook's Pawn to weaken the opponent's King position, opening a second front, taking over the original front of attack, immediate peace redeployment once that goal is achieved, breaking the fortress, safer king. And I hope this is the game I'm thinking of. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is the game where Alpha Zero is black. So again, you kind of see it from both sides of the equation. I want to show you guys the one where Alpha Zero was white. I think it was this one. Yeah, Alpha Zero's new approach in the Carlsbad. Yeah, sacrificing structure to open lines against the opponent's king, long knight maneuver, opponent's passive pieces. So as I did with that bold Sir Lancelot game, I'm just going to very quickly play through this. But just take a look at how different this is from the usual approach in the Queen's Gambit Declined. If you play these structures or have this in your repertoire, I think you'll notice immediately how different this is. Okay, Black puts the bishop on d6 as opposed to e7. But we largely get a position where I think you could reasonably expect a minority attack out of white. So the knight has been developed to f3, so white usually in those cases is going to dispense with the whole f3 plan. Sometimes you try to outpost the knight on e5, but here that's not really possible. I could see a ton of human players just playing rook b1 and trying to go for b4 in this position. But what does alpha 0 do? Well, it kind of feints towards the queen side. It plays queen b3. Stockfish tactically defends the uh, pawn on b7. So if white plays queen takes b7 here, black can go knight b4 and that queen has no way out. So alpha zero is unbothered. It just plays rook fe1. And now stockfish can't resist trading on f3, creating a weakness. But watch how the play now gravitates towards the king side. Alpha zero returns the queen to d1, plays f4, trades the dark square bishops, Puts the queen on h3 to target h7. Plays king h1. And as you might expect, a rook very soon appears on the g1 square. And from here, the squeeze is on. The play has been effectively shifted to the king side. And because white hasn't touched the queen side, 
there hasn't been any weaknesses really created. Because the thing about B4, and Sadler talks about this in this chapter, it does create some weaknesses for white too. But if white hasn't touched the B pawn or the A pawn, there's not a whole lot for black to latch onto over there. And Stockfish goes into grid its teeth mode. Alpha Zero frequently, frequently uses this outpost on E5 for its rook. Yeah, and now it starts this knight maneuver. So a typical Alpha Zero long knight maneuver, transferring the knight from C3 to the huge square F5, where it attacks G7 and H6. Avoids a queen trade. Ends up fixing the queen side, so trying to close things over here. Suppressing any possible counterplay from black. Knight makes its way into h5. And then there's a trade of queens, and white soon is able to win a pawn out of this. Yeah, picks up the e6 pawn. And from here, the game lasted um, another 45 moves nearly. But alpha zero eventually converted. Really nicely using this d4, e3, f4 structure. A lot of maneuvering. These engines don't go down easily. <laughs> Notice again the knight working its way around. It ends up getting into c5. And I know I'm going through this at light speed, but just to give you a flavor of this. There's a trade of knights on e4. But alpha zero comes back, picks up the e4 pawn. And this leads to a hopeless rook endgame. That Stockfish's handlers, or rather the probably the deep mind team, decide to call it. So win for white. So cool to see this chapter too with kind of innovative approaches, courtesy of Alpha Zero on traditional opening schemes. Nice to see that. Um, yeah, I selfishly like to see openings that I was interested in, like the same ish in the minority attack. And now the final chapter, chapter 18, technical note. If you're interested in the number of games that Alpha Zero and Stockfish played, also the hardware they were playing on, that's included here. They talk about the TCEC conditions. That's the world computer championships that are constantly going. Sadler documents how he analyzed... Um, there's some actual examples in this, in this book too, of Sadler playing out positions against Stockfish to kind of test its resource in certain positions. Yeah. Stockfish and Alpha Zero. So, yeah. Mainly trying to test, test Stockfish and see, uh, how up to stuff Stockfish was in certain positions, as you imagine, like it was pretty difficult for him, but that kind of shows he was going the extra mile, um, and overall, I was just very impressed by this book. Like I said, I think there's a lot to take in here. A lot of chess content, a lot of inspirational chess content. And I think Sadler and Regan did a phenomenal job. So again, chess content I think is aimed at pretty high-level players. But if you're lower rated and have an interest in this, I know Alpha Zero has been um, in the chess news a lot and it's really captivated everyone. You might want to take a look at Game Changer. Uh, I think it's, it's worth every penny. So thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed this preview. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And I'll be back again soon with another video. Bye, guys.